Dr. Ken here with you, Lesson 10, Part B. We're talking about capacitance again as we draw to the end of our unit on DC. So, about this particular lesson, we're going to explain how to determine total capacitance of groups of capacitors, either connected in series or parallel, and the reasons for both types of connections, why you might want to do that for a particular reason. So the contents of the textbook, so we're using um, Phillips textbook of um, electrical trade principles and 10.4, 10.5 and 10.6 from the text. Types of capacitors, capacitors in parallel and capacitors in series. So types of capacitors is the first thing we're going to look at. Capacitors in electronics are physically small, whereas electrical work, they can be quite physically large. And it's not the actual capacitance itself that makes a capacitor large or small. It's the amount of voltage that's able to withstand that actually determines its physical size. In power transmission distribution, capacitors have to handle high reactive power levels and high voltages. These types of capacitors are physically large, although their capacitor might be actually relatively quite small, as I was just saying. Capacitors are given various ratings. The main two ratings are capacitance and their working voltage. If I were you, I'd get a red pen and put a circle around each of those aspects. So capacitors are rated by their capacitance and their working voltage. So power capacitors. This is a bank of power capacitors um, at 132kV and you can kind of tell they're up in that order of voltage because I'll just turn my, um, my pen on and if you actually look at the insulators, the stack insulators, you've got insulated to each capacitor but the actual capacitance, because this will be one phase here, two phases, just out of view, three phases. So the voltage between the phases, can you see this big stack of insulators in here? That's indicating us that um, it's about 132 kV. Over here on the right hand side, we've got a single capacitor. And over here we have what's called a tapped capacitor. So we can actually have a common and then a, a couple of tappings that we can switch in because quite often these large capacitor banks in uh, high voltage substations are used to do voltage and network correction on the network and they switch in the banks as required. So typical capacitors you might come across, these are what we might call lighting capacitors and motor start capacitors. So you can see here, again, let's just have a, a quick look at the, uh, the labels. You can see this one here is 18 microfarads at 450 volts. It's only got two terminals, but it's got multiple connections. There's spade connections on those, so this one's probably out of a uh, maybe lighting control something like that this one here you can see is only 10 microfarads but again rated at about 300 volts 50 hertz or 60 hertz this one again there'll be a common and tapping one tapping two again being able to be used often in motor start applications uh, here's a Plessy plastic canister capacitor, and again, this one's only one microfarad, but again, it's physically large because it can handle 400 volts and 1200 volts DC, and probably typically found in lighting, and this one over here in the silver can is definitely a lighting capacitor. You can see on here, it looks like I can just read what looks like about six microfarads and again at 250 volts so there's your typical 
large end motor start and fluorescent light power factor correction capacitors. So these are what we call polyester or plastic film capacitors, um, largely used in electronics. So we have on the left hand side here, um, general plastic film capacitors. And again, uh, you can probably see this one here is um, 0.33 microfarads at 250 volts. There are many, many, many different ways to label capacitors. You can see here, this one uses color coding. Very hard to read here, but this one says 0.04K23, indicating that's its capacitance size, 4.2 microfarads. This one here, polyester capacitor written on it, and you can see it's 1,000 picofarads. You can just read the picofarads here. Up here we've got 0.22 microfarads, 630 volts, what we call green caps. These ones are called green caps. Again, can't read the labelling, but it's the label that tells us the capacitance. Here we have 0.47 microfarads, again at 250 volts. And again here, a 0.1 microfarad at 250 volts. So these polyester capacitors You'll notice that there's no plus or minus there. There's no polarity as with the previous canned capacitors. No plus or minus, so it doesn't matter which way you connect them in the circuit. They're not sensitive to polarity. So these are plastic film capacitors called rolled stripped or metal film between plastic foils. Capacitors can be used for electrical equipment operating from 240 volt up to 250 or better. So, you know, as I said, there's one there that we think found at 600 odd volts. So again, um, high voltage applications for these plastic film capacitors. These are ceramic capacitors and ceramic capacitors, just by their shape, the definition and the ceramic they're made of, tend to be a very low value. So our first one here at 22 picofarads, then 150 picofarads, 100 picofarads and 22 picofarads. So there's numerous types of ceramic devices giving a wide range of ceramic capacitors. The ones shown above have a low K dielectric, so it gives them the ability to have a small capacitance. Um, and these capacitors are actually very good at charging and discharging very, very quickly at high frequencies. So you'll often see these types of capacitors used in radio communications applications. Electrolytic capacitors. Electrolytic capacitors have a dielectric formed by a chemical action, and these ones do have polarity. The most common is what we call wet aluminium type. Because the dielectric is extremely thin, they have a large capacitance, but their voltage ranges tend to be low. The dielectric is formed during manufacture by passing the DC current through the capacitor. In use, they must be connected to the correct DC polarity, so they can only be used with DC. And here we have some typical um, electrolytic capacitors, they call, because we use electrolysis to create them. They're called electrolytic capacitors. So we have tin can types. Um, we can get some reasonable voltages out of them, even though I said it's the low volts, they don't tend to get up to 600 volts, that kind of area. So our first capacitor here in the blue, the electrolytic. Um, the next one long, you can see this one's 63 volts. But look at the capacitance, 2,500 microfarads. So very high capacitance values, again, this one here, 2,500 at 35 volts. And you'll notice this ends the plus, this ends the minus. If you connect up an electrolytic capacitor the wrong way, you'll get a bang, a pop. Um, that you'll destroy the capacitor. So again, they either label the negative end or they put a stripe 
down the can of the capacitor indicate which side is the negative and obviously the opposite side is the plus. So again here 220 microfarads at 35 volts. So they tend to vary around a few volts right up to about 50 or 60 volts. So here again 1000 microfarads at 25 volts, 10 microfarads at 16 volts and so on and so forth, 100 microfarads at 25. So the big thing to remember about electronics, they are polarity conscious. They have a minus and a plus terminal, and it's important you connect them up the right way, but they are capable of having large amounts of capacitance, so we often use them in power supplies, DC, AC to DC power supplies, and they're used as what we call filtering capacitors. The next is um, tantalium capacitors and super capacitors. So on my left hand side here, we have tantalium capacitors. They have better stability and low leakage. The big, big plus of the tantalium capacitor gives you a large capacitance value at very low leakage. Once you charge a tantalium capacitor, it will pretty well stay charged forever. The previous ones, the electrolytic capacitors, you charge those and after a few hours they discharge across the electrolyte but not tantaliums they do not leak back across their own electrolyte so they're very good for accurate timing applications and particularly long periods of timing applications over here we have supercapacitors and you can see we have here a one farad we're not talking microfarads one farad but you'll notice the voltage is very low. It's only 5.5 volts. So supercapacitors tend to be used as batteries. They charge up very quickly and are used to do memory backup in computer systems and those kinds of things. So supercapacitors have huge capacitance and you can get them up over three farads, which is very, very large capacitance. But as the capacitance goes up bigger and bigger, their voltage gets smaller and smaller. Quite typically, you can often see in microprocessor-based computer projects, might have a three farad capacitor, but it's only at about one and a half or three volts. But that's enough to hold up the memory, and will hold up the memory for many, many years. So supercapacitors, that's basically their main application. So next, we're going to look at variable capacitors. Variable capacitors are used mainly in electronics communications. They have a capacitance value that measures in picofarads, so that's times 10 to the minus 12. The capacitance is varied either by changing the effective area of the plate or by changing the distances between the plates. So here's some uh, typical um, examples, this one here is our typical um, radio tuning element for large radio applications and these fins just rack in and rack out as you turn the shaft. So tuning capacitors. This one here despite being blown up, this is very, very small. And if you ever had a small handheld transistor radio, this would be the same version of this. Done with some sliding elements, but instead of using air, they just use plastic. Here we can see a cutaway picture of a capacitor. And again, they're using a screw approach, so they as you turn this little screw here, it winds a certain amount of the plates in and out of contact with each other. And similarly here, you can just see this plate component here can be rotated around and make more or less contact. So most of these are changing the area. So the area is being changed area is being changed, area is being changed. So that's how they work. 
So we now move on to some um, capacitor symbols. It's important that you understand what the uh, symbols are. A fixed capacitor, it's drawn just like the plates of a capacitor and the space in between is the dielectric. So this is your typical uh, ceramics. So ceramic capacitors, your polyesters, those kinds of things. This one over here, they've drawn one plate empty and one filled in, the positive one's empty. So this is your electrolytics. So this is your electrolytics, which are polarized. So that's an important term here, polarized. Then we've got capacitors that are variable, so it's the standard capacitor symbol and an arrow through it to indicate that it's adjustable in some way. And then a trimming capacitor, instead of using an arrow, they use a little T on the top to indicate T for trim. So there is your four basic capacitor symbols, non-polarized, polarized, variable, and a trimmer. So capacitors in parallel now. So 10.5. Capacitors in parallel are like just adding more area. So wherever we put a capacitor in parallel, we're increasing its capacitance very, very quickly because we're simply taking the area of one capacitor and adding it to the area of another capacitor. They don't have to be the same area, they can be different areas and effectively we're just adding areas together. The thickness of the dielectric or the distance between the dielectric here is not changing. So no change in dielectric thickness that remains the same across the two capacitors. The only thing changing is that uh, our area of our capacitors get, getting larger and larger. So the effect is the plate area is increasing tremendously as you connect capacitors in parallel. So connecting in capacitors in parallel simply gives you more capacitance. The total capacitance equals the sum of the individual capacitance values. So C1 plus C2 plus C3, etc. So here's our equation for capacitors in parallel. So the capacitance total equals C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus so on and so forth. You just simply add them up. And the voltage rating of the capacitor is simply the voltage rating of the smallest voltage capacitor that you've used. So if you've used, um, I'll just quickly draw this on the board because I don't think I actually put this on the slide. If I've got a capacitor and the plate distance is this and it's 100 volts capability and I parallel it with another one like this and it's got 20 volts and I parallel it with a third one and it might have a capacitance of say 50 volts. Sorry, yeah, 50 volts. So it's capacitances. So we might be talking 100 microfarads, 200 microfarads, and another 200 microfarads. Its capacitance is this formula. So I'd have a total of 500 microfarads when I parallel them together like this. So C total is going to be 500 microfarads. But the, cap the voltage that it can withstand, remember capacitors are rated by capacitance and voltage, it won't be 100 
it won't be 50 it will be this one the 20 so it'll be 500 microfarads at 20 volts because that's the minimum voltage that can be withstood by the capacitor in the network so C is the total capacitance C123 are the individual capacitance values and here we have an example of C total is 1 microfarad plus 1.8 plus 1.2 giving us a total of 4 microfarads charge in a parallel capacitive circuit so remember charge Q taken by each parallel connected capacitor is the product of the capacitance times the voltage so Q equals V times C the total charge taken by the circuit is the sum of the charge on the capacitors so we're just simply adding up the Q's so the total charge is also equal to the product or the addition of all the voltages product of the voltage and the capacitance or just add them all up individually so capacitors are now in series so when we're adding capacitors in series the surface area is being affected but we're also doubling up or tripling up the thickness of the dielectric so with capacitors in series Let's get this pen to turn on here we go we are concerned with area but it's going to be the capacitor with the smallest amount of area that counts so in this particular case the smaller capacitors area is the only one that's going to count So when we parallel it together, we're only going to be using a small part of the bigger plate area, in effect. So what we end up doing is, when we're putting capacitors in parallel, we're ending up with the smallest plate area, but the maximum amount of thickness of dielectric. So we're adding the thickness of this dielectric is being added to the thickness of this dielectric the result is a capacitor that has thicker dielectric and its plate area is the area of the smallest capacitor so connecting capacitors in series gives less capacitance because the effective plate area is reduced and the equivalent thickness of the dielectric is increased so as we put capacitors in series, our capacitance goes down, but our voltage strength, our voltage capability actually goes up. So if this capacitor here was rated at 60 volts, and this capacitor here was rated at 10 volts, our capacitance value has gone down, but our voltage capability has gone up to 70 volts as an example so the equation for capacitors in series now this one's a little bit tricky you may say wow that looks like our resistor one for resistors in parallel well actually it is it's the same equation as for resistors in parallel but when we're applying it to capacitors it's for capacitors in series so don't get confused it's simply C total is 1 on 1 plus the invert of C1 plus the invert of C2 plus the invert of C3 so on and so forth or we can write it 1 on C total which is the way I prefer to write it plus 1 on C2 plus 1 on C3 plus 1 on 
C4, etc., etc. Where C is the total capacitance, C1, 2, and 3 are the individual capacitance values. So all you've got to remember is it's the same formula for resistors in parallel, but it's applied to capacitors in series. So let's do a quick little example to get it into your head. And uh, you might want to pause the video here and have a go yourself. And, uh, but I'm going to just go quickly through and um, explain the math. So we've got our three capacitance values, pretty obvious, one microfarad, two microfarads, and four microfarads. We can't just simply add them up because they're in series. So we've simply got to take one on one, one on two, and one on four, that's our inversion. And we've just left everything in microfarads because we're going to put our answer back in microfarads. So to keep the math easy, we don't have to go times 10 to the minus 6. It, it's okay, you can do it that way. But since we're going to leave our answer in microfarads, we can just work in microfarads. So if I take the invert of each of those, and then when I get the, the um, invert, it's... 1.147 therefore I need 1 on 1.75 and that gives me a total capacitance of 0.57 now just a quick way that you can check yourself that total capacitance value has to be less than the smallest capacitor in the circuit so we know our smallest capacitor in the circuit is 1 microfarad so we've got to say to ourselves, is the value that we calculated less than one microfarad? The answer in this case is yes, it is. So it's probably the correct answer. So charge in a series capacitive circuit. So we're playing with Q again. Remember, charge Q taken by each series connected capacitor is the same. So the Q is the same throughout the whole circuit. That is Q for the total is the Q on 1, which is the Q on 2, is because the Q on 3. So if you work out the Q for 1, it is the Q for everything. If you work out the Q for 3, it is the Q for everything. Also, Q total equals the C total multiplied by the V total. So if you know what C total and V total are, you can work out Q total, which is how we normally do it. That's why I put it in red. So again, Q total can be Q1, can be C1 times V1, can be Q2, can be C2 plus V2, etc., etc., and so on. Doesn't matter which Q you use, the Q is the Q is the Q in a series capacitive circuit. So in a series circuit, each capacitor stores the same number of electrons. Therefore, the voltage adds up, as I said. So if the first one here, for example, in this particular case, get my screen pointer options on. So if I have 20 volts, 10 volts and 20 volts, the overall voltage of the circuit, it will be able to withstand 50 volts. So by putting these three capacitors in series, the one, the two, and the four, I end up with a total capacitance of 0.57 microfarads, and it's capable of withstanding 50 volts, the two things that are the most important way of describing a capacitor. So in a series circuit, each capacitor stores the same number of electrons. So DC voltages are cross capacitors in a series circuit. Because each Q in a capacitor in a series circuit has the same charge, the same amount of Q, the voltage across each capacitor 
will depend upon its capacitance. If each capacitor is a different value, the voltage across each one will also be a different value. So that is V1, or the voltage across capacitor 1, is the Q divided by C1. The voltage across capacitor 2 is the Q divided by capacitor 2, and the voltage across 3 is the Q divided by C3, so on and so forth. So here's a little example. Here we've got a 2.4 microfarad capacitor, a 4 microfarad capacitor, and a 6 microfarad capacitor. We've got an 80 volts applied across it, and we want to know what the voltage is across V1, V2, and V3. So to find the voltages, we've got to calculate the total capacitance. So we know that C total, they're telling us, is 1.2 microfarad. So if we take 1 on 2.4, 1 on 4, 4 plus 1 on 6, add that together and invert it back, you'll get 1.2. Remember, our capacitance total has to be less than the smallest capacitor, and the smallest capacitor is 2.4, so 1.2 makes sense. So the calculate the total charge, the Q total, is 96 microcoulomb, or 96 times 10 to the minus 6 coulomb. So find the voltages where Q total equals the charge on each capacitor. Because there's 96 coulombs in C1, there's 96 coulombs in C2, and there's 96 coulombs in C3, because the charge is the same in each of the capacitors. So this is how we work out the voltages. We worked out our voltage total, which we already had. So I'll just turn the pen on quickly. So we already kind of got to here. Then we worked out our 96 microcoulomb. And remember, it's the same for C1, for C2, and for C3. So now we, all we have to do is work out the voltage. And we simply take our formula, if you remember our formula, Q equals V times C. We want to transpose and put V as the subject of the formula. We simply divide both sides by C. C on C is 1, so we can cancel that out. And V equals Q on C. So there's our formula, V equals Q on C. So all we have to do is put in our 96 Coulomb here, divide it by, in this case, 2.4 microfarads, and we will get 40 volts across the first capacitor. Do the same again, our 96 microcoulomb divided by 4 microfarads this time gives us 24 volts. Voltage across the 4 microfarads. And finally, we do it all again, but this time with 6 microfarads, and it comes out that we have 16 volts across V3. So we end up with 40, 24, and our 16 volts across V4. So that's how voltages work in series circuits. And if we add those up, that adds up to our 80 volts which was the applied voltage across the circuit. So that brings us to the end of DC lesson number 10, part B. Hope you've enjoyed learning a fair bit about um, different types of capacitors, capacitors connected in parallel, and capacitors connected in series.